Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to this week's Q&A. It's Thursday night, so it's a little bit earlier, and next week I'm probably going to have to do it early Thursday morning, just because I'll be heading out to Portland the next morning. So uh, sorry if any questions get missed on either day, but there seems to be a few this week, so let's jump right in. First up are two questions from Joshua Witt, and one of them's way easier than the other, so I'll answer that one first. Um, when using an oscilloscope, how do I know what the correct peak voltage levels are for RGB and sync signals? Is there an official standard uh, that says sync is X millivolts and the colors are also X millivolts? Yeah, so you're gonna want the colors to be about 700 millivolts, and lower is always better than higher. And the reason for this, if you have something that's like 670 millivolts first of all you're probably not going to be able to tell the difference in brightness it's going to be really small but if you did tell the difference all you'd have to do is just turn your brightness up a notch whereas once you start to get over seven i think it's 714 millivolts exactly but once you really start getting over that the image could get washed out exactly like overexposing a picture so while you could still turn the brightness down, you're still losing all of that color information. So I always aim, uh, and it also remember that no two consoles are gonna be identical because all of them shipped with components that are probably 5% tolerance. So anytime anybody I know is working on a device, I try to tell them to aim for just under 700. That way the 5% swing, even if it does go over, will, probably won't be enough to lose info, but it's always better to be too dim than too bright within reason, of course. You don't wanna start dropping way too low. And for sync, um, you know, safe sync voltage is between 250 millivolts and one volt. Um, I try to have everything that I work on hit around 450 just to, just to be safe, but you know, anything around that should be fine. Definitely do not go over a volt though, because once you start passing that, then you start getting past tolerance levels and you could potentially blow out any equipment. Uh, and your other question's a bit more complicated. Is there any difference between C-Sync directly from a console and C-Sync that's from a sync stripper circuit stripped from the composite video signal? And this is in terms of signal or picture quality or interference. So that really depends. In the scenario of you have a sync stripper in the SCART head and unshielded cables, uh, then it's really gonna be as bad as if you didn't have it at all because the interference will, or the signal on the CVBS, the composite line, will travel through the cable next to the other colors and interfere onto those. And by the time it hits the sync stripper in the SCART head, then the information's lost. Um, the sync strippers and the SCART head are a really good idea for setups that require C-Sync, but you're using something like sync on luma so you're not going to get any uh any problem with that because luma is just brightness info and the sync info so that's the only time that would make a difference um, if you're talking about something like you have a fully shielded cable and let's say you're running it into a, a g scart switch or something and then you're outputting that sync stripped signal um no, there really shouldn't be that big of a difference, uh, and you really shouldn't have to worry about picture quality, but it's really just all about making sure that the composite video signal, and most importantly, the color information, is isolated. So I, I hope this is making sense. I did a couple of videos. If you just Google like retro RGB cable, unshielded cable on uh, YouTube, you'll see the teaser video, the short, short version, and then the longer, more in-depth version that kind of goes through all this stuff. But the the only real difference, um, I guess that would apply to, to people using equipment is that if you need to use a sync stripper for whatever reason, put it as close to the source as possible. Otherwise, you'll still get the interference. Uh, if you're designing products or if you're in a scenario where there's many sync strippers in a row, that could cause issues and stuff. So maybe re-ask again if it's that scenario. But it just sounds like you're looking to measure your signals and to make sure that everything's as good quality as you can. So I think that's a good start. But let me know if I need to follow up. Moon Turtle had a few interesting questions. Um, with the new production of Virtual Boy multi-taps coming, uh, I'm assuming you mean the, the virtual tap, the video outboard, um, they're considering installing a $3 Chinese to S video or composite circuit with a multi-tap for their setup. Um, so that might cause problems, but I'll continue along with your questions just to hopefully clear this up. One, if they manage to get lucky and the S video circuit isn't trash, how might I expect it to affect the picture sharpness 
or monochrome contrast coming from RGB on a 37-inch consumer-grade CRT TV. So um, if you're going from VGA to S-Video, it's probably going to be something that uh, that um, interlaces the signal and possibly even adds lag. Um, it really, It really depends on the setup, so I would try to skip that unless you knew specifically of adapters that could do that properly. And then RGB to S-Video or Composite, I've never seen a cheap circuit that's able to do that properly. All of it treats um, progressive as interlaced, and you have all the issues that I just highlighted in that scalar video. Um, I think a much better option would be to go straight RGB, and uh, if your TV has component inputs, get one of those uh, RetroTINK transcoders. Or if not, I mean, you might as well uh, try to look for a device that does RGB to S-Video. Um, I believe there was some out there. They're getting fairly expensive these days. So to be honest, it might actually be cheaper to RGB mod your TV. But I'm not sure that you'll be able to make a decent circuit with this. Uh, if you have the technical ability to do so and you want to try, definitely go for it and see what happens. But um, yeah, I'm not sure about that. And number two, will a VGA multi-tap, virtual tap, output better quality than RGB when converted to HDMI? Um, I, I would say yes, only because the aspect ratio is going to be okay. And the next part of your question is, any idea why the aspect ratio was squished for RGB? Just to be able to make it fit within RGB resolution. Um, it's just the way the Virtual Boy's resolution is. Uh, Furtech made it so that you could still use it on RGB monitors. Uh, and that's great for people with full setups that want to add their Virtual Boy to it. Uh, but if you're going to HDMI at some point anyway, VGA is going to be better just because it's higher resolution and it's the original aspect ratio. Um, all Anytime you go from analog to digital, there's going to be a, a tiny bit of analog noise. Using filters can help this, and there's something coming out soon that might be a help to you, so stay tuned for that. Um, and the last one, number three, can I suggest any no-cut no cut options to install the output ports? Um, I have no clue. I, I couldn't figure out an easy way to do it. Um, I, I really... I didn't try really hard, I guess, but I, I did spend a few minutes trying to look and see if there's something I could do. Um, but if you do a really good job, you can make it look factory. And, you know, if you ever have the, uh, the choice, like if you have multiple virtual boys, use the one that's already beat up. And that's what I did. Mine was already, mine had already taken quite the beating. So I didn't feel as bad when I drilled the holes, but take a look, see, maybe you can get creative and think of something that I didn't um, you know, if you don't use the speakers in your virtual boy, that might work. Uh, you could just use headphones, but all good questions. The only thing I would hesitate on is, uh, that RGB to S video circuit might not be as easy as you think because of the way the, you know, it's one of those video chips that's designed for TV signals, not video games, but you know, give it a try if you have the ability. Dave Phipps wanted to chime in when it came to buying RCA cables that are good quality, and Dave recommended Blue Jeans cable, which are probably in the Pacific Northwest region, and uh, they might even be at Portland Retro Gaming Expo. So if they are, I'll, I'll definitely go check them out. But I guess they could do custom lengths and offer multiple shielding options. So uh, I'll definitely stop by their booth if they have one and try to go see them, because I'm always looking for good sources for cables. And the short time I spent working in the high-end uh, audio-video world, um, a lot of it was snake oil. You know, I always laughed at the $19,000 power cable where you had to clamp your own uh, ends to it and everything. Like, there's a lot of stuff out there that doesn't matter. And then there's a lot of stuff out there that seems expensive until you really look into the process that you go through to make the cables and to ensure their quality. And that that's what I'm very happy to pay the extra money for. So hopefully Blue Jeans cables that, and I will follow up if I get to meet him. Cole Voggs wanted to know if there's any way to play Pure Solar on a Genesis without using an EverDrive or buying a reprint on eBay. Um, you know, I'm not really sure. and I'm not really sure what's up with Pure Solar. Um, you know, it, I'm always a little leery to give advice on how to pirate stuff, especially if it's things still being sold, uh, which I don't really know. Maybe it's not. Maybe the developer said go for it. But um, I think at the very least, you would have to use a flash cart or, uh, or try to make your own repro with a big memory chip in it. But I don't know enough about repros to answer that. And once again, I certainly don't want to take money away from Pure Solar if 
people are re- or legitimately still selling it and not just reproing it out. So sorry I couldn't answer that one better. Next, Nick had a good question about power conditioners. Um, he wants to know if he even needs one if he's using a UPS. Because if your consoles are being powered by the battery on the UPS, does it even matter what quality the power going into the UPS is? So that's something we talked in great detail about on the Retro Roundtable. And just a few weeks ago, I saw uh, what I thought was a good quality UPS go up for sale. So I asked Renee about it again because I was too lazy to go back and rewatch the whole podcast. Uh, and I was reminded that... Um, it would have to be a very good quality UPS. And I'm, uh, I put links um, in response to your question if you want to learn more about this. I'm going to give the very short, short version, so oversimplified that Renee is probably going to smack me in the face the next time I see him. But overall, what you want is a perfectly clean sine wave power signal. So if you have a really good UPS, when it switches over from wall power to battery power, nothing ever changes and that sine wave continues to be drawn the same exact way. Um, If you have a cheap UPS, it's using uh, a simulated sine wave, which is, it's, I'm not going to call it dirty power, but it's not as clean of a signal. So your choices in a situation like this would be to either get a really expensive and really good UPS. And if you get a lot of brownouts, that might be something that you want to look into investing in. Uh, My apartment in Stamford, Connecticut used to lose power five days a week, minimum. And it was always like, you know, off, one, two, on. And so it was just enough to screw with equipment, but not enough to, you know, to really be uh, bad for living in. So because of that, I picked up some mostly good quality UPSs with some junk ones on equipment I didn't care about so much. So like my TV, my RGB monitors and stuff would have, uh, you know, a power conditioner or a good UPS on it and stuff that I, I couldn't care less about, like a DVD player or something that would just go on a basic UPS. Um, so if you don't want to invest a lot of money, a good thing to pick up, which I'm using now per Renee's recommendation, is an APC box. That's kind of like a power conditioner and keeps the signal steady. Uh, and that, as long as you're not getting constant brownouts, that should be good enough. And I'm 99% st- uh, sure it's on my Amazon links store. I've been putting stuff there, especially stuff that doesn't fit anywhere else on the website yet. I don't have a page on power. So, um, you know, anytime you want random recommendations, check that. And I try really hard to keep that up to date. So, you know, as far as I know, there's never anything linked on that Amazon store that's no longer good anymore or whatever. So, uh, yeah, check that. I'll leave, I guess I'll leave a link to that as well, probably in the main description of this, just for the heck of it. Um, and just scroll through to the right section. So, My current setup, I have like an average UPS for all of my computer equipment. I have one of those APC power conditioner things on my rack with my 32-inch BVM. And then I have another one that my OLED TV is plugged into. And I make sure to only plug things into that that doesn't go over the full wattage rating. You could see everything right on there. Um, And that you could actually put a lot through that. You know, Uh, I would put one one monitor and one console on at a time through it and my OLED TV doesn't draw as much as the BVM so there's not as much hooked up so I would kind of just go through that and if you want more details try to find that retro roundtable episode because Renee really gets into it and I I really learned a lot from that so uh, hopefully the links would at least point you in the right direction for today. Leland Redmond pointed out that they never have time to listen to these and it makes them sad (laughs) so uh On that note, I I would like to remind everybody that in the link wherever you support, you'll see the MP3 version of this as well. It's a mono 128K version, so it's as small as it can be without getting crappy. Um, And I try to make everything I put out available in multiple platforms just to make things easier for people. So if you don't have time to watch these, feel free to just listen. I know a lot of people prefer to listen listen to these podcast style stuff over watch it. Uh, And also a little trick that I use for when I need to preview and and test out my own stuff, you could use Dropbox to put the MP3 on your phone. And that way you could listen um, while your phone's in lock mode. You don't have to like leave your phone on and your browser open. And obviously you could download it offline for viewing later and stuff. So uh, feel free to do that if that's what's easier for you. 
I don't have it linked to the direct podcast app because there's no way to regulate supporters only or anything like that. So, um, or when that would be released, maybe that's something I could try to implement, uh, in the future. I just don't know how I would have time to do that now. Sorry, I'll, I'm open to any ideas. If that's something that's really important to everybody to have it just pop up as an audio podcast on iTunes and Spotify, I could figure out a way to make that happen. Um, but for now, if you just want to listen on the go, MP3 should be a decent way to do it. So thanks for the support, Leland. Jordan Chaston has a few questions, so I think I'm going to answer them in different segments in case I screw one up. That way I don't have to go back <laughs> and redo the whole thing. Uh, first question. How would I go about connecting multiple MIDI modules to multiple computers? Ooh, that's a good idea that I have no clue how to answer. To continue the question, though, um, Jordan would like the ability to hook up 8 to 10 computers to at least 4 MIDI modules, um, but possibly more. A matrix switch would be great if such a thing exists. Uh, a 10 by 10 MIDI matrix switch would be ideal. Um, I have never done that before. The, in fact... The most experience I have with MIDI is hooking up electronic drums or trigger drums to Pro Tools for demos. Um, in, in case there's any music nerds listening, um, I have always preferred the sound of real drums, but when you're demoing, it's super easy to just uh, hook up triggers or to have an electric kit and just record that way, put it through like the slate drum thing. And, you know, for, for demos, I think that's absolutely the perfect way to do it. For real drums, you should really go to a studio and have it done right. And before you sign the contract, make sure that you want real drums because I got screwed hard on that one. The al last album I put out is mostly triggered drums, and that is not what we wanted or were told. So <laughs> just a little warning there. Um, as for your matrix, which I have no clue if that even exists or if it could exist, uh, you certainly wouldn't be able to... Uh, well, I don't. I shouldn't say certainly. I'm pretty sure you shouldn't be able to. Wouldn't be able to split the MIDI signal to have multiple computers reading it at the same time. But one at a time, like your standard uh, matrix switch, might work as long as you know that way. You could have you could connect whichever to whichever, but one at a time. I think a good person to ask might be the girl geek. Um, hit her up in Discord, and uh, if, if she has a bunch of experience with MIDI stuff like this. So uh, hopefully, if you're in the Discord, or I guess on, she's on Twitter as well, maybe she'd have time to answer your question if she knew the answer. Second question from Jordan. Can I recommend any high-quality, large KVM switches? No. And the reason is, most of those KVMs were designed for use in IT shops, server rooms, things like that. So video quality was never one of the things that they were focused on. It was just the ability to use a KVM without screwing up the computer. Because don't forget, too, I'm not sure how old you are, but back in the day of PS2 keyboards, it was pretty common that with KVMs, you might, when you switched back to one uh, on a cheaper KVM, it wouldn't recognize the keyboard or mouse or both uh, sometimes. We're talking a long time ago, by the way. So I think people who make KVMs really focused on that. So, uh, with USB, it's a, a little easier, but you're still worrying about you know that the the sound uh, in the the system dropping the connection and re reconnecting it. So as far as I know, all the brands that I've used over the years focused on connectivity and not video quality. So if you're looking to switch video at the highest possible quality. I would look into something like a VGA, um, uh, I forgot the name, a 10, A-T-E-N, uh, has a 16-port VGA switch um, that came out, I, I used that for a while, and I noticed a little bit of signal uh, interference, but not enough not enough that would ruin the experience for me. Or, of course, you could just use any of the Extron switches that uh, are generally perfect for that. And then separately use a KVM for a keyboard and mouse. And, of course, that means you would have to change two devices. Um, but I, in my personal opinion, as long as I had everything numbered the same, you know, one is number one on the cross point, also one on the KVM, vice versa, I think that would be a good solution. Um, but I could be wrong about the KVMs. So if anybody listening happens to know one that's great quality, um, please let me know. Uh, I'd kind of be curious about that myself. But my gut's telling me that a cheaper and better overall way to do this would be to get any old KVM on used piece of crap on eBay for a keyboard and mouse uh, and switch video with something like a crosspoint. 
Question three, Jordan recalls hearing that someone was working on a DS mod to allow real video out, not the USB-based thing, uh, and wants to know if I've heard of any more on this. So I will say a few things. First and foremost, I always keep everybody's secrets, whether I'm friends with them or whether I absolutely can't stand them. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that I always, always keep my mouth shut. And last question from Jordan, one that I get quite often. Do I have any experience with downscaling HD to 240p? Do quality lagless solutions exist? No. <laughs> um, so you could use devices out there like um, the Corio TV1 and, of course, the Super Emotions to go from 480p to 240p. They both add lag uh, one or two frames. I, I can't remember which was which, but they, they definitely add at least one frame of lag because they need to buffer it in order to, to downscale it. I don't know if you could use the TV one to do like 720 to 240. It's possible. Once again, you're still going to get lag. Uh, and there's been talks of people... Um, there's been talks of people trying to figure out building like a reverse OSSC, but there's been some complications with that. And I think the main developers involved feel as a whole that there's not enough sales to justify the insane amount of work it would take. Um, I don't know if I agree with them on that, but it might be one of those things where there's only 300 people in the world that would want it. And once they buy it right away, they're super excited. And then the rest take forever to sell out. So I, I don't know how true that is, but look into on the shmups forum. Um, Dockerty did a guide on, I believe it was Dockerty on the, uh, how to use and configure the Corio TV one. Uh, and that might be good enough for what you need now. And of course, if there's any major updates to this, I will post about it and do a crazy video ranting about how excited I am for that. But I absolutely think that that's a cool thing to have and that there are certainly scenarios which if there could possibly be a lagless version, um, it would be a big benefit to people. And I think the number one thing I could think of off the top of my head is the retro USB AVS. 200 bucks for a perfectly working NES where if you could plug a device into it and make it work on an RGB monitor, now you have a completely plug and play NES that works in RGB. Both Solid Unit and Dan Mons chimed in in regards to the question Buster D posted last week about doing the 120 hertz trick. Um, Solid Unit, no disrespect whatsoever, but I think you may have misunderstood. Um, your answer uh, is regarding using the OSSC to double the 240p resolution to 480p and use it on a CRT monitor. Uh, yes, that definitely works. There was never any question of that. What they're talking about is uh, like super resolution. It's a little bit more complicated. Dan gets into it. He said there's a few options. Via emulation, you could do 240p at 120 hertz. So it's still 31 kilohertz compatible with VGA monitors or line double to 480p at 60 hertz. Uh, and that's with a scanline generator, which kind of makes it look identical. Uh, this is something that I want to double and triple check because the last time I added scan lines to a 480p image on a CR, uh, like a PC CRT, uh, it didn't look the same as 240p. And I spoke to a few people about it after I read the question last week, and they said try it again and make sure scan lines are at 100%, and I might get much better results. Uh, but to continue with Dan's answer. Mr. does perfect line doubling that's compatible with VGA monitors for many cores, not all, but many. And a scan line generator will make this look nearly identical to a BVM on even a low cost PC VGA monitor. And thirdly, you could do something like console to RetroTINK 2X to, um, or OSSC or something to an HDMI to VGA, which is the same thing that Solid Unit was talking about. But again, that's uh, you would have to use um, some kind of scan line generator. So here's uh, here's the short short version of all of this, the way that I understand it. And Dan, please correct me if I'm wrong on this. But trying to get 240p working on a VGA monitor uh, with proper looking scan lines is something that I've always been interested in because you could still find cheap PC mo uh, VGA monitors that look great. Um, you know, you could find them for easily for free um, if you get a smaller size. And then even the 17 and 19 inch ones that used to be thousands, you could pick up for a hundred bucks or so. And they're really high quality. And obviously it's great because you get to use any 480p thing on it as well. So just line doubling to 480p 
is a very easy way to do that. Oh, the OSSC is probably one of the best ways to do it. You could also do, like Dan pointed out, the RetroTINK 2X or RAD 2X, and then just use an HDMI to VGA converter on the end of that, which you can get for like 20 bucks or less for pretty decent ones. Um, the only problem is getting the scan line look. And the last time I really dug deep into this was years ago. So I need to redo this. And I keep meaning to shoot a video on it using my multi-sync BVM, but just haven't quite had the time. But I think if you use the OSSC and you add scan lines at 100%, it should look very close. I'll have pictures and video at some point when I have free time, probably late next month. Um, I really want to see how this looks and compare because this could be a very easy and cost-effective solution for people that don't want to spend uh, money on a BVM. And more importantly, if you want to have a choice of gaming on a CRT and a flat screen, using the OSSC for both overall is obviously a great way to do it. But the other way of, of generating these scan lines to get that look was what I was always kind of fascinated about that I think I first heard heard about it from Dan, and that's the 120 hertz trick. So I believe that's running, uh, I, I think you could either do it by 240p at 120 or using some kind of, um, uh, you have to get the settings just right in the emulation, but without adding manual scan lines to it, the effect makes it look exactly as if there were scan lines on it because of the way the image is generated. So probably didn't get that last part quite right. Uh, but yeah, if some, I guess to sum this whole rant up, I will be diving deep back into trying to make 240p retain its original look on a VGA monitor uh, for as cheaply as possible. I'm going to jump into that soon, and I want to make sure that I could do it with um, both emulation and original consoles, because I think that's also really important. And I'm pretty sure light gun support is not going to work, but it's something I'm going to test anyway, just for the heck of it. So thanks very much, everybody, for chiming in. I'm 99% sure I got everything right except the 120 hertz trick. and I, I think I got that mostly right. Adam Cameron said he picked up the G-Comp Switch 8x2 and had a couple questions. First, can you use the component and the composite on one input by plugging both in and using cheap splitters for the audio as long as one console is on at a time? I think you're pushing your luck there. At best, you might have signal drop, but at worst, by having all of them connected, it's going to change the resistance. Uh, and while I don't know if it would damage anything, you'd probably see signal loss. So I wouldn't do that. Uh, two, he believes he heard about a 3D print solution to screw the G-Comp switch to the wall. Uh, do I have a link? Yeah, check check the uh, the post just from a few days ago. But basically, it's laserbear.net. That's Greg Collins' shop. And you could just buy that. Uh, they call it the bumper switch with the wall mount bracket. And the wall mount bracket's $2, I think. So uh, that one's good. And number three, if you end up buying a G-SCART switch in the future for RGB-only consoles... Could you convert the output on the component and then input it in the G-Comp switch? Uh, yes, 100%. In fact, I might have a prototype here. Uh, no, but it's going to look just like this. This is the transcoder from RetroTank from Mike Chi. So what you would do is uh, put whatever your target display is. So if your target display is component only, uh, you would get this exact one. You would get the RGB to component and go the output of the G-SCART into this output of this into one of the eight by two or one of the eight ports in the component switch. And then the other one that's uh, released, which is going to look identical, except have different lettering. You would do the opposite. You would have a uh, component in to this RGB out from that. And then you would be able to link the switches together and it shouldn't be any signal degradation, uh, at least something that would be noticeable by the human eye. I, as soon as I have time, I'm going to measure that on a scope just to double check. Um, and that's one of those things where, you know, I would like to see a perfect conversion, but as long as it's not way off and the test that Steve and I did last summer, so a year, year and a half ago now, I still haven't finished the video on it. Um, we saw a bunch of conversions that were way off, not nitpicky. It's just me being crazy, like way off. So I'm uh, in my limited testing with the retro tank ones. They've been perfect. 
I just want to put that on a, a scope to double check so people could confidently buy these knowing that not only have I given it my thumbs up, I looked at it and it looked cool. I also have solid data to back that up, which is something I always like to do. But you know, short answer, yes, the retro tink stuff is 99.999% going to be the best solution for you. Uh, and it sounds like a really cool setup overall. Brent Vecchi said, by the way, did I get Vecchi right? Uh, Brent said, ever since I saw your presentation at Too Many Games this year, I started building an RGB setup, and I'm absolutely blown away at how good retro games can look and feel with the right equipment. Thank you so much for saying that, Brett. I really appreciate that. I'm trying really hard to spread the love of this stuff, as well as make sure to burn the info in people's brains that you don't need to spend a million dollars on this stuff, but if you like the extra quality, you get, could do some crazy stuff as you've already seen. Uh, to continue, um, he's chip modded and replaced caps on a few consoles, which has taught basic skills. Awesome. I find this really enjoyable and I'd like to learn more. Can you suggest where and how other than formal education to start learning about the more technical aspects of consoles and how to troubleshoot problems? Uh, he'd like to start figuring out problems by testing rather than scouring forums and blindly following instructions. Um, this is going to sound like cheap self-promotion, but I'm being dead serious when I say the Retro Roundtable, while a little bit ridiculous, is also an excellent source for getting into the detailed stuff. Um, we have some of the greatest minds in retro gaming there and me. And, uh, and it's, I've learned so much just from my friends in doing that. Um, I would also kind of poke through retro RGB whenever you have a chance and check out all the info that's there because the short, short version on why I started the site is because of the exact thing you pointed out, you know, having to sift through forums and try to figure out who actually knew they were, what they were talking about and who was just poking around and and accidentally figured something out. It was a nightmare to get started eight years ago when there was no solid info. Um, my my guides don't cover everything you need to know, which is another reason why we're opening up a public wiki, which at this point, uh, I think I'm the person slowing it down. I think I need to go in and uh, start testing and work with Justin to finish that off. But that's, that's when things should really start blowing up because it'll be open to anybody who wants to contribute and all posts have to be verified. So so it would be, at the very least, it'll be something that's probably a better step than randomly going through forums. Um, no one's perfect. We learn a lot as we go. I've updated all of my guides over the years, but I think that's going to be a great resource for, for people to do a lot of stuff. Um, and other than that, uh, I would just check out Voltar's videos for soldering. Um, one giant mistake that I made when I started out, uh, both on my personal consoles and on retro RGB, is I showed a lot of tricks that could, you know, that make things easier to get done for beginners. But the problem with doing stuff like that is that it almost always comes apart eventually. So you could do, I, I used to use like weird ways to, uh, to connect wires to make it easier to solder because I actually, when I, I forgot that one of the things I bought was a wood burning iron and not a soldering iron. That's what I get for spending like $8 on something. Um, so... I, you know, I think I would just make sure that you kind of pick up tips from the experts and try really hard to emulate what they do. Uh, in fact, one good video, if you want to laugh as well, I did a video with Voltar called My Messy Mod Work or something like that, where I took all of my old work, and some of it was just benchtop quick test stuff, but we, we made fun of all of it. So it was a great laugh. I didn't feel bad because we weren't making fun of anybody. I was making fun of myself. Um, but at the same time, we went into why I thought it was a good idea to do it that way, why it's a bad idea, and what the right idea is. And after Zach really burnt that into my brain, I started realizing that teaching those tricks, and you know, those were off the website seven years ago, so don't worry, there's nothing on there like that still. Um, but teaching those quick tricks was not the right way to do it, because it would always come apart. And you really, uh, if you've already started doing cap replacements, you've probably already noticed that um, taking your time to do something and maybe doing it twice or practicing on a dead piece of equipment that has similar pads to solder to, you know, once you've really gotten it right, um, it, it's going to last a long time, if not forever. So don't, don't cut corners in places that you really shouldn't. Um, and use equipment that's not crappy. 
Uh, you don't need to spend a million bucks on equipment. Zach did a video on a good soldering iron that I'm still using right now, the Kesker one. There was some some beef on a forum about people that didn't think that they were that good. Uh, all I could say is, after years of using the cheap stuff, I could finally do stuff that I've watched my friends do that I've tried so hard to do and never was able to. And just by switching over to that iron and the, uh, some decent tips everything changed. Same thing with desoldering guns. Uh, I bought the one that was like gun only with no separate module and I, it never worked right. Not from day one did it ever, ever work right. I ruined at least two consoles trying to use it. And when I finally bit the bullet and spent just a few dollars more on the good one, um, it was exactly like I see Zach and Jose do. I just, you know, ding, 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 chip falls out. So, <laughs> uh, you know, definitely get, when I say good equipment, get not crappy equipment. Um, I link to everything on the Amazon store and I try to keep that up to date because, you know, bigger sellers or sometimes just Chinese manufacturers will uh, switch out their products halfway through a, a product line. So the same exact thing that you bought a year ago would be a little different on the inside. I think everything's still cool though. Uh, so hopefully that's good enough to point you in the right direction. Um, any other questions, please feel free to uh, to ask here, and I'll try my best to help out. And uh, definitely check out at least the Messy Mod Work video um, and, and some of the Retro Roundtable re episodes. I don't know how much you'd want to go back and listen to, but maybe pick it up the next time we do it and kind of just go from there. Well, that's it for this week. Just another reminder, I'll probably have to do next week's Q&A early Thursday morning or maybe late Wednesday night or something. So uh, expect it to be a short one or just everybody get their questions in ASAP, please. Sorry about that, but I just um, I have to get up super early to get to Portland on time for Friday. Uh, so it's going to be quite the busy weekend for me, but I'm really looking forward to meeting everybody out there, hanging out in Portland and having a great time. So uh, very excited for that. And also, uh, anybody that's new to these, ask any question you feel like um, in the newest Q&A video, wherever it is that you support. Uh, I turn the comments off on these, and I stick to just the support services, because this is really just a thank you for all of you. Um, and then I make them public about a month later, just kind of as a courtesy. And because I think a lot of people that support just want to wait for it to pop up in your YouTube feed and aren't in a rush to get to it anyway, which is totally cool. So uh, any questions at all that you have, just ask in the latest Q&A video. Uh, and once again, if I don't get to it, it's probably because I did the video too early. Um, so please just ask again if I miss your question. As always, thank you so much for your support, and I'll see you next week.